Hello and welcome back to Logical Magic Examining Esoterica. Hey guys, today Rachel Garrett, who is such an incredibly good sport. I have a couple of people here who um, come back and talk to me about topics and Rachel has been kind enough um, to go ahead and do this. And she's really great at her job. You can find her at Akashic Angels or AkashicAngels.com um, and she is somebody that can help you with your life's purpose, your life's path, helping you to heal your trauma. And um, she's also, as I said, someone who's been very generous with her time on this. I'm Elaine. Um, you can find me at atherisingmoon.com to book me for a tarot card reading or a life coaching session. I have a Patreon as well, where there are going to be weekly readings. I've been teaching tarot in reverse. A couple of other things are coming up as well. So what's the topic today? The topic today is an interesting one, and I've yet to figure out what the title of the episode will be. But it is about finding the middle ground, the balance between logic, fact, and science, and then faith and belief. And when you hear the word faith, I'm begging you, just do not think of religion because that's not what I'm talking about. Remember, religion is a man-made structure that is built around faith, and it gives people guidance in how to practice it. It gives somebody like basically a direct report before they go to the divine. When I'm talking about faith, I'm talking about your own personal connection to whether you believe it is spirit, whether you believe it is God, a goddess, whatever it is that you connects you to the idea of a higher self or a higher purpose is what I'm talking about in belief. But science is also very, very important. It is one of the things that has freed us from very punishing cycles, particularly as women. And I'm a person who identifies as a woman. Rachel is a person who identifies as a woman. Um, death from childbirth was incredibly common all the way up until like the la turn of the last century and the uh, advent of uh, antibiotics. And for me, this is a personal like resonance because the reason I ended up believing that there was a divine presence where I felt like there was some proof of it had to do with a man named Jonas Salk. And Jonas Salk is the inventor or the discoverer of the polio vaccine, which none of us were alive for that, but it was a terrifying time. So this is a man who grew up in poverty in Queens and he went to a public college and he was one of the most brilliant research minds that ever lived. He actually died while he was one of the lead researchers on the AZT cocktail. So first he saved the world's children from a terrifying disease. And then on his way out of this lifetime, he helped free people from a terrible disease that was destroying their immune system. That carried a lot of negative judgment with it when it shouldn't have. And so when I saw that person's trajectory, I thought that Stephen Hawking, a very, very famous physicist, um, declared, I think it was in like 2017, like the last time of the world where I really would have wanted to hear it. I was in a bad marriage and things were like going like south within the world. Um, Stephen Hawking concluded that there was no divine presence, that there was no God, um, because he could not see a function for it. And in science, we look for the function and everything. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, he's wrong. There is a function for the divine. It is the thing that helps us evolve. It is the thing that helps us overcome our lower aspects, like greed, like hatred, um, like envy, like lust, like all of it. I'm not talking in religious terms. I'm not. But we all know that we can be drawn by our shadow side, or we can go towards our higher purpose, where we achieve of ego death and spiritual enlightenment. And so uh, that gave me a lot of comfort is like reading his reasoning on why there was not a divine presence. Um, I was able to refute that in my own mind in a way that had a lot of resonance for me, but that is belief versus fact. Now here's the interesting thing. What Stephen Hawking was stating was also belief, not fact, because you cannot prove a negative. Like there, he, there's no way to prove there is no God. Uh, atheists always fascinate me because they are displaying the same psychological function as people who ardently believe something. They are displaying, it's the same psychological, like you have very firm parameters around what you will believe or what you believe to be possible. And the truth of the divine is that it's not provable. It is either a connection that you feel or that you don't. And I felt a connection to something my entire life. And it always fascinates me that I'll meet people who they do not. And so that is their absolutely valid answer where they're like, yeah, there's nothing. It's like, that's weird because I have things that I can put together that begin to form proof in my own life of like, that's, that's really bending over backwards to believe in coincidence and the chaos universe in order to say there's no pattern here. 
there is a pattern in my life and there is something that has guided me. And that is what I call the divine. But I do not practice a religion. I'm a celestial and angelic magic practitioner, which deals with theosophy, that deals with the figureheads from the Christian religion, from the Hindu religion, and from Buddhism as well. So it's a it's like all paths to God are valid type of thing. So that's the big long intro. And Rachel, can you give me a couple of thoughts? Because you're like you're a registered nurse. You manage yes. a doctor's office. You know that yes. Western Eye Medicine can save lives and does save lives, and that we're very, very fortunate to have um, access to these advanced medicines. Although our medical system is deeply broken, we do like it still exists as a possibility throughout the you know developed world. So, can you tell me a little bit about your own struggles between I like logic, I like science, I like things that are proven. I like peer reviewed data. I like all of that stuff. That's where my mind naturally goes. I grew up with Mr. Spock. I love logic. But <laughs> by the same token, I know that when I'm reading for something, I get information that isn't found on social media that like only that person would know. And so how in the world do I know it? So yeah. you have the same. Thank, he- here. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Thank you so much again for having me on. I appreciate it. And you do bring up a lot of valid points. And as you're saying these things, I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Like, especially with the polio vaccine and now I'm running a doctor's office and seeing people refusing to get vaccinations and now having things that have been eradicated come back. And is it, is that science? Is it belief? What is it? And why are people so against vaccinations? And I find it, and it, there's a lot of false narratives out there. And there's a lot of false truths and people truly they grab onto something and I guess that's their belief that, you know, oh, this is fact, this is reality when really it's not. And and I find that so fascinating to me. Like, let's take the COVID vaccination for, you know, example, some people are against it, some people are for it. And it's like, it, it was, it divided people. It divided people, even in the spiritual realm. Like I lost friends, you know, running a doctor's office and, you know, seeing the science and all the doctors were very like, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then my own belief system, like, do I want to introduce this to my system? Do I not? You know, and I, people refuse to learn classes from me. People refuse to connect with me because I had introduced that into my system. So it was, it was fascinating to see how divided we became. So why do I love bringing science with my belief system? There are so many books now out there about like how our earth is electromagnetic and how that grounds you and how that brings you peace. And why is just walking outside barefoot so good for you? Well, because it feels good to me. No, actually, the earth's crust is electromagnetic and it's actually grounding to you. So I love that there's actual I feel like there's so many uh, researchers out there that are ahead and like let's talk about um, psychedelics. How many people now are looking into the realm of psychedelics for for pain management, depression, for all of these things? And me being a registered nurse, do I necessarily, and I have depression, I understand, like sometimes I may need to go on a medication and I am not against meds 100%. If I'm lacking a chemical balance in my body, please sign me up for any medication that's going to help me feel balanced, sane, happy, healthy sign me up. Am I going to refuse an antibiotic because I've got a uh, strep throat? No, because I don't want to have rheumatic fever. Like there's detrimental things that can happen when we don't take medications. Sorry, I was off on a tangent there, but back to psychedelics. <laughs> there's so many, like, um, I think his name is Matt Simmon. He's got a beautiful book out about psychedelics and he brings in researchers from all over the world, proving the effectiveness, the responses to all of these things. And I believe having something like that with the belief system of, yes, I can bring in my ancestors while I'm having this moment. I can bring in the angels. It helps me to feel whole. And like you said a little while ago, you've always known that something else is guiding you. You may not be able to put an exact definition on it, but you know there's an unseen force that is helping you along this path to where you don't feel like you're alone. How important is that? And I love the atheist comment too, because it's like, they're so desperately trying to not believe in something that they're believing in nothing. (laughs) It's so fascinating to me. Well, when it comes to atheism, I think part of what people are reacting to is the hypocrisy of many structured and current religions where they claim Mm, to be not really following the teachings of the central figure. So atheists are frequently reacting to the hypocrisy of the religious structures. 
but they're discounting, they they treat faith and religion as interchangeable concepts. And guys, mm. they're simply not. They're yeah, simply it's two different things. You can, I like, I have not participated in a religion in my adult life, but it is obvious that I have faith in something beyond this. And mm-hmm. the first first tenet of faith is that there is more to this existence than we can see. And every single time somebody gets a reading from me, I am proving that because there is no logical explanation why I can shuffle a bunch of cards, put them down on the table and tell them about the parts of themselves they're not telling anybody else about. Because I help people heal their shadow work and process their trauma so that they can find their purpose. And one of the things, and that is revealed in their cards. And there is no logical explanation. I'm often working remotely. Sometimes I'm reading people in other countries. There is no scientific explanation for that. Now, then we get into the whole, the old thing of um, and sufficiently advanced technology will be interchangeable with magic. And like, I believe that I am from a generation, I'm Gen X, of people who grew up with very little advanced technology, only to see it d- evolve in my lifetime to become something that is absolutely amazing. Honest to goodness, like, you know, it was, remember how you used to be skilled yes. at giving people directions and now yes. it's like printing hands- out the map class exactly yeah. like, like, one would be the co-pilot <laughs> like you couldn't get anywhere and like oh we just missed our en- uh, exit like, like n- now we all have a pocket wizard with us that tells us how to do everything yeah. we only really relate to that world when the internet goes down and we're all at a loss going i would suck at being amish but honest to goodness that is Believing in the ability to have a uniting force is one of the things that you talked about the anti-vaccination movement. Um, One of the things that happens in a psychological construct is that we seek unifying events. We have it within us to want to have a sense of community. And my firm belief is that anti-vaxxers were mostly reacting to the concept that, you know, our government tells us one thing and does another. We're all very, we've normalized, yeah, all politicians lie. Well, that, of course, corrupted our faith in all structures. And so it becomes, you start to distrust everything that comes from a governing body when you can see easy and obvious corruption from every angle. And it's not one party or the other. Um, very obviously, I'm a, like I, I, I'm not actually a Democrat. I'm a registered independent. But I lean very far to the left in absolutely everything. That cannot come as a shock when I'm always talking about the fluidity of gender and a couple of other things. But I do not define people by who they voted for. The things that we believe are mostly things that we are are kind of steeped in that we are programmed to believe that we are taught to believe and one of the freeing concepts of faith of real belief that is outside of a religion is it gives you the ability to understand what you truly believe when you have a direct connection you worry less about what the unifying events around you are doing but you have your own inner guidance you know what you believe and you know what you are trying to act for in this life But that never will negate science. One of the problems that we've had is in the spiritual community, um, there's something called junk science. And there are a lot of beliefs, particularly around the pyramids, that are not actually based in any form of scientific fact. It started out with um, people negating the Egyptian people's ability to be as advanced as they clearly were. They couldn't find an explanation for it. It's like, well, they were advanced. Like, so were the Romans. So were, there are many ancient civilizations that were incredibly advanced for the times. We didn't, like, we're, we're tomorrow's dinosaurs, guys. Exactly. Try to, try to embrace the idea that everything that you believe now, people will look back and be like, can you believe they practically peed in their own drinking water? Oh, my God. We are tomorrow's dinosaurs. And if you can encompass that in anything that you believe, it will soften the rigidity around your beliefs. And why is that important? Not so that you won't know what you will stand up for so that you can recognize when you're wrong so that you can recognize when you need to go in a different direction, when you can recognize when you need to follow your individual guidance rather than the guidance of that amassed power, which always begins to corrupt over time. Honest to goodness, I think a lot of people who start out in politics have very good intent, but then they're working within a corrupt structure. And the only way to achieve anything is to then work with that corruption rather than fight against it. 
and nothing gets done very much. So Rachel, can you tell me a little bit about your own faith journey, your own journey with belief in what you're attached to? Yes, I love that question. So I am originally from the South and I was born into a pretty religious background. Southern Baptist, went to the church multiple times a week, all of that stuff. Um, and then we, in Georgia, I, you know, my, my dad got remarried and then again, we were born again Christians. So then Halloween was now evil and I didn't resonate with that belief system. So of course I snuck out and still went trick or treating, but it's like, you know, I had to believe what I believed in. And then moving from Georgia to Ohio, I went to an all girls Catholic school. And then I was told that we were all sinners. And I used to get in arguments all the time with the nuns. I'm like, you can't tell me I'm a sinner. I don't believe in that. That's not true. Don't say that to me. Out of class. Okay, fine. Bye. You know, it's like, I'm grateful that I've, I've had a strong sense of connection to my faith that when, no matter what people are saying to me, it, it's not going to resonate. And then I went to a spiritualist church. And then it was like, like beautiful to hear these messages from divine. And I think that was my first real spark of being connected to divine. Like, you know, you're connected, Rachel. What does that mean? And then they would talk openly and lovingly and without judgment about, okay, your guides, your teachers, this and that. And then that really kind of propelled me on this path, you know, of going to Lilydale, going to Salem, you know, getting a bunch of books. I've been grateful to take, you know, world religion and just really kind of, and I like you, I, I take facets from certain belief systems and I've kind of developed my own. And yeah, I think that's my journey. And then, yes, I've always had science to back me up. So I've been a registered nurse now for over 20 years. And so to have the science and my belief system, it's like, okay, well, how is it that I have trauma from when I was born? You know, that my mom maybe had a traumatic birth and this, that, well, you're her cortisone levels and your cortisone levels were high and elevated. And I love that you can back that up with the science, but also do spiritual work such as energy healing or getting a reading from you or, you know, and saying, okay, how can I remove this energy that's been embedded into my cellular tissue? All thoughts have, you know, our thoughts create our reality. The body keeps the score. Everything that if I've, if I've had these cycles and loops of bad talking to myself, of course, it's going to get embedded in my cellular tissue. And then it's going to manifest in my physical reality. So and then it's like, okay, well, the science aspect of it, maybe that's a rash. Maybe that's anxiety. Maybe it's my hair falling out. I don't know. But I need to find the spiritual component to be able to heal the scientific component, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So for me, I can, I can pull in the science of, all right, Rachel, I understand the science behind it, but I don't necessarily need to see all four energy layers. I just know that they're there because of science telling me so. That's <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So just because I don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Um, boy, that's like, that's how I'm always trying to get people to understand spirit attachments and the idea that like, there could be life forms in other dimensions that we simply don't understand. The other thing that we need to understand in the, hey, we are tomorrow's dinosaurs is please understand most of our scientific understanding is actually in its infancy. We it is 100% agree it with you. We don't understand a lot of our brain functions. One yeah. of I'm talking about where there is more to this world. We can see if I can put out pieces of paper and tell you things that you're not even about yourself that you don't even share with your best friend is so that there's, there's something there. It doesn't mean it doesn't have a scientific explanation. It doesn't like they may not understand the neuroscience be between being able to reach forward in time. We do know that time is not a linear structure now. No. So it is actually possible that many of the things that you and I put down to faith, the narratives that are constructed around that can sound very whimsical and people start rejecting them. And yeah. it is when it, please remember, it's a narrative that was constructed to help people discover their ability to understand and believe. I was not raised in a church that said that the Bible was literal. I was raised in a church, the Episcopal Church. It's not exactly an out there church. It just happened to be a super, super um, uh, kind of liberal and forward thinking one that the Bible was allegory. Now, I am also a student of history. So I know that throughout history, most of the uh, what we would consider the modern times, the Bible was treated as allegory. And as the world became more and more hmm, divided and divisive, 
that people began to retreat into forms of extremism. Mm -hmm. And I think when we start talking about like religion or belief, people immediately identify with the most extreme version of something. And it's like, you know what? It's personal. It's a personal guidance within your life. Some people go to a structure where somebody else is telling them how to think and feel about their connection to faith. But if you actually really, really have it, nobody gets to interfere with that. Like you really... It, it's it's a very difficult thing to adequately describe because why do I know something's there? Because I can ask for help with something and it will arrive. Absolutely. I can figure out things about myself to help heal myself that I shouldn't have the base knowledge in, but that it comes to me. And then I have so many therapists as clients because there's a lot of psychological validity to the things that I teach. But I didn't learn them in a formal setting. It's coming to me from a collective consciousness or from a higher power. And again, I get really uncomfortable with labels that have a tendency to be distancing. I don't know what it really is that I'm in contact with. I've always related to it as the Archangel Gabriel since I was a child. Um, but the, it's <laughs> people who've had meetings with me, they hear something and they hear it in a way that they haven't heard before. And guess what? That's what the Archangel uh, uh, Gabriel is in charge of, epiphanies, which is divine guidance and divine light and divine intervention. Now, that does not mean that I'm some kind of incredibly holy person. Oh my God, am I ever difficult? I'm a booger. I cannot believe that I have to deal with me sometimes. But I'm also like, uh, we all contain our opposite. So like you can be an amazing, great person contributing tremendously to the world and still know your personal struggles. And that is not a contradiction either. It is simply that more than one thing can be true at once. And I have a tremendous faith in and respect for scientific development, theory, data, a process that puts things through rigorous intellectual standards mm -hmm. and still be like, and yet there is something that guides me towards the idea of we are led to our answers. And that's what I finally came down on in the whole vaccine thing is that different people were led to the answers that for whatever reason were right for them. And I have a very deeply weird thing about me. I can never read in a blood test as being immune to rubella or what's called German measles. I have been vaccinated for it three times and I've had it. <laughs> My titers always come up as that I'm not immune. It, it's it, it, And it always comes out that way. Do, you too? <laughs> Yes. Oh my God. I didn't think I, because the, the medical staff always, always treats it as like, we got to vaccinate you for rubella. And I finally just started saying no, because I yeah. was like, I've had it three times, man. I don't think I've been vaccinated multiple times. <laughs> so it's not that uncommon. It no, well, that uncommon. maybe just for me and you, but I've always, always like, did my parents not vaccinate me? Like, I, like, I wasn't on like, a carrier because of stuff like that. And that's actually what I really came down on in the whole vaccine debate, because I have friends who are vaxxed to the max and boosted yes. beyond. And then I have people who like literally were carrying fake vaccination cards because they were so against it. And like, they're like, I re have respect for people on both sides of that argument. And it's like, I, you know, I believe in your ability to be guided. And for whatever reason, that was the right answer for you. And I don't know why different people got different answers, but I do have, I don't need company to know when I'm right. Mm. And that's, that is really, really like the, I kind of want to say the litmus test of what I put my own, hey, listen, are you not being grounded enough? Are you believing too much in the immaterial world and not enough in the material world? Um, that's the litmus test for me is like, do I, do I have evidence that makes me very comfortable with it? That comes from the practical, the 3d world. And then what is my intuition telling me? And we're always talking about, you have a tendency towards depression. I have a tendency towards depression. I don't think I, anybody ever guesses that about us when they meet us. Cause I think we're both high level maskers. It's like, I am happy and sunny. We're and high stop. functioning. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's apparently we really are from the same clan or something because I have the exact <laughs> same tendencies. And I know that medications that can help alter your brain chemistry can make all the difference in the world and I would never yeah. look down on them. But I also know that plant medicine has a an application as well. And that what I finally came down on is make room for more than one thing being valid in this world. Yes. More than one yes. thing being 
the right answer for another person and to not be challenged when somebody else has an answer that is in variance with yours. And that is really where coexistence with faith and science exists, is not being threatened by what mm -hmm. other people believe. I'm not talking about fact, I'm talking about belief. Right. Your, your beliefs are individual. They are personal. Your connection to your source is personal. You may share it in a group setting, but you are all reaching for the same thing. And we do know that there's a lot of corruption in power structures, but power corrupts. The ability to control other people corrupts people. If you look towards the teachings of the central figures of any faith system, they're all telling us we should be kind to each other. We should take care of the sick. We should act as a society. We right. should embrace compassion towards right. all and most most say please don't judge one another which is also one of the things that leads to a lot of wars and fractiousness and all of the you know difficulties that we saw and then as we know that things aren't working well in this world that whole we like to be divided into camps that won't budge that will not listen to one another that cannot like if you don't believe what i believe then you're stupid and that really honest to goodness is like, please remember everything you believe, literally everything you believe is part of the environment that you were raised in. And I'm Absolutely. always talking about that because I came from Northeastern Pennsylvania and I'm in Southern California. Now I've had a very interesting and diverse journey, but I came from a like coal cracker area of the world. I have a lot of affection for it to this day. It has been economically depressed since God was a boy. It is like, it's always been that way. Um, and I know that if I had remained in that area, I might believe entirely differently than I do now because I wouldn't have had the exposure to different forms. I wouldn't have had the exposure to the different forms of culture that exist throughout this big and diverse country and this big and diverse world. And to remember that whenever somebody believes something that is against what you believe, they're not doing something to you. They're just giving you the evidence of the different environment in which they were raised. And literally nobody ever changes their, their mind on anything by being insulted or berated. So please don't approach each other that way. I get that we have a lot of societal issues that need to be solved, but they're more likely to be solved if we draw together and we quit pointing figures and figuring out who's to blame. We're all to blame at this stage, folks, because we're all part of this world, which means that we all have a role to play in trying to make things better. Rachel, you, you bring me. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> you no, please. You're about to say something. Um, you bring me to a point about my sister. My sister is an atheist, and she's like, "But I believe in community. I believe in family. I believe in loving one another. I believe in the goodness of others." You know. So, and she's like, "You know what? And when I pass, if there's a heaven, I'm surprised, and I'm grateful for that." So, I do agree with you in the fact that we do need to shift back to being of service, being in a community, we got really divided, you know, being isolated, you know, on our own, and maybe in our little pod groups or whatever. And it's I'm now looking for community. Maybe it's within my faith, maybe it's within my spirituality, but I just want that connection to community. And I think like you just said, I think that's where these beautiful ideas of change and progress, and how can we heal the planet? And all of these things will actually start developing if we kind of get off the blinders and if we stop arguing with one another and just compassionately listen, and then we can have mindful discussions. And it'd be so important. <laughs> um, and, and again, I think, you know, not to like define your sister's life or her or anything, of but course. She, she appears to be re um, relating the idea of a belief in a uh, divine figure with the religious structure that I know. <laughs> let's face it if you like a lot of logic it's really really easy to look at the bible and go Bailey, this is this is a fairy tale <laughs> this this is somebody trying to um reinterpret teachings to be able yeah. to control a populace it was necessary at the time it was written you know people did not have yeah. a particularly sophisticated understanding but in a time of science you do not need to believe wholeheartedly. This is the literal word of God. It's a translation of a translation of a translation. It's not right. the word of anything at this particular point. But right. what it is, 
is a story that gives you a guidepost to how to find your best self and how to be the most connected to your own higher self, which is what your sister's talking about when she believes in community and right. she believes in family. She is connected to a higher purpose version of herself and that she rejects the idea that there's a unifying force is fine because you're, the answers you come to are the right ones for you. The problem comes in when you want to make everybody else have your answers. They are individual, mm -hmm. they are different, they have their own unique and individual soul. And you have to make room for the idea that it's not threatening when somebody believes something entirely different than you do, unless they believe that everybody has to believe as they do. And they want to control the world around them with those beliefs. Then that becomes, hey, listen, you're entitled to your personal relationship with the divine, whether you approach it through a church, whether you approach it through a bunch of trees, which let's face it, I like that's really where I have a tendency to connect to my own ability to believe as I get out in nature a lot yeah. and sit on rocks and meditate. And that's where I end up feeling guided. And I come home and I do things that I'm like, I feel very inspired to do this. And it works out really, really well. And so that's where it's like, I can't just put that down to random chaos. Mm -mm. It's like when I go out into, it's like, well, maybe it's just the cessation of the technology around you and being by yourself gives you clarity of thought. Maybe, or maybe it's that and that clarity of thought connects me to something that is trying to help me make a difference because that is the most important thing in the world to me. That is the thing that that's I so always true. wanted to be able to do was to become a better and better person and then to do something in this world to try and help it because the suffering of so many bothers me so, so much. It's so unnecessary. We could do more to help each other if we weren't yes. always arguing about who's right. You are right for you, but please quit trying mm -hmm. to control other people because you're, so other people believing something different is not threatening to you unless you make it so. Exactly. And exactly. it's, it's hard because we see those coexist um, stickers, which I guess this is really what this episode is about. When I email, Rachel is a saint and like she will not tell you about like, hey, this crazy woman I met sends me these emails with these incredibly dense topics. And she's like, I'm not really sure what it's going to be about, but we're going to cover this, this and this. I love her, your email. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yes. tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> That people who are secure in what they believe are not threatened by the idea of what others believe. They Absolutely. don't think it will negate their true connection. If you really have faith, what another person believes in no way challenges you because it is not about the other people. It is about what is within you and what you feel and whether or not you feel guided. And I am somebody who like, even as little as, you know, five, six, seven, ten 10 years ago, I guess 10 years ago, the life I live now, I would have been like, oh, really? Because I love science so much. I like, I'm always like, uh, even on my TikTok, I'm always uh, uh, like reposting uh, physicists talking about what we understand about black holes and things. It seems incongruous with what I do, but I'm fascinated by science and by the developments that have come within my lifetime that make me believe we can become something more, mm -hmm. but that I couldn't... <laughs> I couldn't deny the validity of what I kept encountering as I don't know how I do what I do. It didn't come with a manual, but I do know that like I can perform a form of spirit mediumship in which I didn't even know I was going to be doing a spirit medium read the other day. Somebody came to me, they had a question. I knew how the man had died and it was really unusual and it really gen and I'm not going to go into it because client privilege and all of that, but it like, it's that sort of thing where the person is confirming what you have just said is completely accurate. And I had no way of knowing that was going to be in that particular reading. So it's real, even if I don't mm -hmm. understand it. And that's what faith really is is yeah. that it's the evidence of something that lacks a scientific explanation, but you can't deny that it is interacting with your life. And if you do, because like I could explain all of this away, and like I'm always talking about litmus tests and how I put things through, with what you and I both do, and because I have had a history with anxiety and depression, I am always going through like, this is not a mental health crisis of some kind, is it? Is this fitting the standards yeah. of this? Is it fitting the standards of that? Is it like, I'm always trying to make sure it's like, I'm not just simply crazy here, right? 
Obviously not when I can tell people about stuff that they experienced when they were six that they never told people about. Yeah. So I, it, what is it? I don't know. It honest to God, yeah. has a scientific explanation and I make room for that as well. But it gives me belief that there is worth in doing what I do and that there is worth in the people around us and that we are all struggling to survive and to heal. And as soon as we start seeing each other as people who are also on a struggling journey, we're more likely to start helping each other. And if we help each other more and worry less about who's right and who's wrong, things will get better. And people Absolutely. will have to believe what is individually right for them as long as it harms nobody else. You also bring me to a really good point about the healing of the divine. I recently participated um, in a, uh, it's called PUNT, it's for pediatric cancer. It's for all families that have lost a child to cancer. And they actually reached out to me very, like, I don't even know, like, they reached out to me and they asked me to come and teach a workshop. They're like, it's controversial because it's about teaching them how to connect with their spirits since they've passed. And to be the, how these connected points, like I'm not in Buffalo, I'm on the other side of New York and, you know, and to have them and their grief, like they've all suffered a tremendous loss of losing a child to cancer and to see them being open and vulnerable. And for me to be able to say, yeah, if your loved ones are with you and let's talk about it and this and that, and to be able to channel in that healing and to show them being like, you're right. I have seen where this person connected with me and they shared really funny stories and they were very lighthearted and you could just feel the waves of the grief kind of some of it came off. Obviously it's always going to be with them because grief stays, but I, I love the divine brought me to this group of individuals to be able to talk about eternal connections. We talked about angels, we talked about signs, we talked about this. And it was interesting. I think they reached out to me because I am a registered nurse. So I do have the science backing to say, okay, yes, I have a science backing, but let's talk about the signs that your loved ones are leaving you. Mm -hmm. And one lady shared a really funny story about how they find, found a feather in a very odd place. But I was like, as a nurse, like I was just like, you know, I wanted to hear more. But I'm so grateful that Divine... I never thought I would participate in something like that ever. And I'm so grateful. I, I was so grateful that I got to do it though. And that I provided them healing. And I truly believe if I didn't have a science background, being a registered nurse, they probably wouldn't have reached out to me. If that makes sense. It's like, it was kind of a way in for the people who, you know, are resistant to it, which is fine. It, it gave Absolutely. you, it legitimized yeah. your ability to say something with conviction right. because you were not ignoring. If somebody has lost someone to pediatric cancer, then they yeah. are deeply involved in the medical system. Absolutely. And so having somebody who is conversant with and works within the medical system saying these things, it yeah. like it does, it strikes that standing in the middle between, I do love facts, I do love science, I love the advancements that we have made, and I simply yes. hope we can make more and more, particularly around ending things like uh, food deprivation, which is within our ability. It really generates water. This. The, exactly. The effectiveness of water. our water, drinking water. Hello. It, there, there's so much good that we could do in this world if we didn't spend so much time fighting with each other about who's right. Absolutely. Honestly, totally agree with that. Um, one of the, again, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this is that. I do have people like my clients are largely people who are very well educated and mm. they feel like they find um, like I was talking about with you, you have that, that, that medical background yeah. that makes perfect sense with people for pediatric oncology, that it would give them a sense of connection to those two mm. worlds, connecting the medical nightmare that they've likely been through if they've lost the child to yeah. the idea of spirituality and not having one negate the other. And, um, you know, I talked a little bit about uh, Stephen Hawking. Yeah. <laughs> Hawking such an interesting figure because he was like a man with a feet, feet of clay when it came to his personal relationships. And he's very, very, very famous indeed. And uh, ALS and was in a uh, wheelchair for yeah. so many years. Einstein actually talks about God. 
but it is the universal concept of the great connecting force in the divine. And that's probably the easiest way to, uh, when I'm talking about the divine, that is also what I'm talking about. The right. God of the Bible to me is, again, it was a narrative built around something during an unsophisticated time to try and connect people to their higher self to help negate our lower, when we're in survival mode, we are far, far more likely to be ruled by our shadow side. And what does the shadow side do? It enhances things like greed, anger, um, conflict. There's a really good reason to try and find the way to reach for the higher method in society as a whole. Unfortunately, yeah. reaching for the higher method in society has been turned into a reason to try and like hate your neighbors, which is like that is just not in the text. <laughs> it's not in the text. It's actually a contradiction of absolutely everything that you believe that you are participating in. If you think you are supposed to judge another person, you never are. I was raised in the Christian church and I remember a lot of what we were taught, but I was taught it as allegory of the stories that would help us understand how to be the best that we could be. Because if we're all trying to be the best person that we can be, we're going to have a society that actually advances. And I really do believe that part of why people become connected to their higher self is to try and help this very limited and conflicted life form begin to evolve towards what mm. we can truly create together when we are doing our best as a society and viewing each other all as teammates rather than like, you're on the opposite side, boo hiss. <laughs> like, no, we're all on the same <laughs> side, guys. We need to get on the same side for a lot of our problems to begin being sorted out. If we were working yeah. together rather than saying who has more than the other person or having all these authoritarian powers, which come to the fore when uh, we're in an insecure time. I'm also talking about the Strauss Howe theory. <laughs> like this is the person I am, the Strauss Howe theory, which is a sociological um, theory about the four generations and how we are in the fourth turning and they are the ones that bring change. We're also always talking about the cyclical relationship of history. And we're seeing that as well with the protests on things like you said yeah. and Columbia and um, it is Columbia, isn't it? Yeah, it was Columbia, yeah, it's Columbia. Where, where they're protesting um, the uh, Israeli conflict with Palestine and right. Israelis, uh, Israel's actions with Palestine. And it is an echo of the uh, protests against the Vietnam War right down to how they're being greeted societally. And right. it's, it's so interesting to be able to view that it's like, there's your cycle repeating almost right down to the details. Please start thinking in terms of energy patterns and the need to break them as being something real. And the only way to break it is to start learning from our cyclical behaviors and choosing to do something different. Because- Absolutely. You can, no matter what you believe, even if you're like, that woman is crazy, there is no God, I've lost all respect for her. I'm not talking about the God of the Bible, I'm talking about a uniting consciousness that, right. is the best that we can achieve, and that is what I call the divine. And if you still reject that, that's cool, but it doesn't negate the validity of the idea that working together is one of the things that would help this world. You can believe that, and I will never question it, I will never be one of those, God believes in you, though, I won't. You believe what is right for you. Right, absolutely. You are connected in the ways to your own individual purpose and path that is right for you. When somebody believes something entirely different from what I do, I don't think they're wrong, they're crazy, they're simple, they're childish. I think that they are drawn towards the answers that are right for them, but that we all get into a form of gridlock when that overreaching power structure is trying to utilize that as a tool to bring about societal change rather than utilizing it as a personal tool to connect us to the best version of ourselves that we can be. If you are the best version of yourself that you can be, you will be living a purposeful life. And it may be very personal. Maybe you're the best mom you can be. Maybe you're the best dad you can be. Maybe you're the best accountant you can be. Maybe you're the best nurse that you can be. But maybe you're somebody who's like, yeah, I'm willing to work within a structure to make sure that everybody has a roof over their head. Because that is one of the things that drives me not to despair, but it is often a drag on my energy in terms of mm -hmm. my passion. There are so many unhoused people here in Southern California. Scary. It's tragic. It is. So many times these people have not done anything that you could ever judge. They've tried their very best. Not that we should be judging other, each other. I'm just saying that 
when you see the victims of a society that no longer tries to provide for its citizens as its first course of action, when you see Bad. people who have fallen through the cracks, please quit thinking they did something to bring it upon themselves because a system that was meant to help them has let them down. And that is society. It is not the government. We form right. societies so that we can have a cohesive unit that protects us against things like calamity and war and disease and the things that have a tendency to go along with living this fragile existence. And I see those people, and honest to goodness, we try to do things through the government, and the government machine has broken down, bogged down. It is so incapable of doing anything in an efficient fashion. It's like, guys, it's up to us. Yeah, it's up to us to say, "Oh God, you're doing whatever you're doing over there." I like I participate in to the extent that I vote, but I don't invest a lot of energy in it because the contradictions, the normalization of lying, is the thing that like nothing gets done when we normalize. Like it's fine if you just lie to my face constantly. I just take it as part of the political process. That is part of the reason that everything is in gridlock over there. Yeah. So what side you are investing in? So when you've got a gridlocked power structure like that, it falls to the people to be able to unite in a way that sidesteps that, that works around it to figure out, hey, listen, that's all well and good. I don't care who you voted for, but I keep seeing a woman in a wheelchair at my bus stop and that's where she freaking lives and it's wrong. What can right. we do about it? What are we trying Absolutely. to do that doesn't involve the government that we know doesn't have get anything done any longer? What can we do to try and alleviate the suffering of someone who's simply ill and has fallen through the cracks? You know, the, this is what finding the balance between the practical, which is what we're talking about with science and data, and the spiritual, which is what we're talking about with faith and a connection to the divine, no matter how it represents to you, no matter how it feels to you, no matter what labels or books you might in, like invest your belief in, that is what that is, is the immaterial versus the material. In the material world, we have many things that we could fix if we could stop arguing among ourselves about who's right and who you're voting for. And instead say, listen, I get that you believe something entirely different than I do. You grew up in an entirely different area, but I've seen how you interact with people. You're a decent human being. And this is an indecent thing that I keep witnessing. People without enough medical care, people without enough food, people without shelter in the richest country in the world. What can yeah. we do? We can't solve everything, but we need to start trying or it will only get worse. And there are so many people with so much money and they just want to watch this pile, this number increase, 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 so that yeah. they feel important and they feel powerful. It's like, what are you doing with that power? Because it's a false con construct if you're just watching an ever-inflating number and thinking that makes you important. And right. it treats those people as being important and more important than the suffering woman at the bus stop. That's really bugging me, obviously. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's that's. There is not more worth to a person who has a billion dollars than to a person sitting at a bus stop, right. unable to find a home. They have right. the same human dignity, and we need to start approaching each other regardless of what we believe, whether we are firmly invested in, you know, atheists talk about the flying spaghetti monster because of the slightly outlandish and obviously fictional constructs that go along with so many religious stories, like people turning into a pillar of salt. And then you have people bending over backwards to try and provide a scientific explanation for that. It's like, or you could let it go and understand that it is allegory, something, a story that was told to help connect people to the idea of what happens to us when we don't act in service of our higher self, which is actually what's supposed to have happened to Lot's wife, who was turned into the pillar of salt. That scientifically did not happen. If you want to stand on your head and say, well, the conditions could have blah, blah, blah. Oh, please, please, please let the need to have proof be the standard for your faith. Faith cannot be proven. God cannot be proven. It is personal and individual. And you don't need anybody else to agree with you to know that you are right in what you believe. But how you act in this world and what we do in this world is the material concern. So you can have your immaterial world that nourishes your soul, nourishes your spirit, guides your steps. But then mm -hmm. there's the material world that needs your actions. And the people in it 
who have been left behind by too many concerns around the material world. And so that's what we're really talking about with learning mm. to coexist. And to, to understand that even making one little difference, it changes somebody's world entirely. It was my birthday the other day. And one of the things that happened was I got an email from somebody who has been following me for years and talking about being able to heal their CPTSD because of things that I talked to them about. And they had booked a reading and said, you know, I apologize in advance if I just cry the whole way through, it will be out of gratitude. And I'm not doing that to be like, aren't I important? Like, I, it's not me, dudes. It's like I'm connected to something that gives me that information that helps. Yeah. Me. So it's not an ego driven thing for me. But it really made me realize to that one person, I changed their world entirely, yeah. what I believe. And that makes, and who knows what they will do with that change? Who knows how many people they will help? Who knows how much better they will feel? Who knows what their path going forward that is no longer defined by trauma and pain might look like? Yeah. That, that was brought to me by this immaterial world, but may make a difference in the material world. So science and belief are not meant to be foes. They are mm -hmm. meant to be in separate lands. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people seem to struggle with. Rachel, views, thoughts, short stories to share. Anything? <laughs> I, I genuinely don't have a question here because like, you have your own experience that I'm <laughs> sure would be illustrative of like what this me discussion means to you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you bring up a very valid point. So for me, being a registered nurse, I'm also a care manager. So I've been able to help people, you know, that are unhoused get into housing, help people that, you know, need counseling, get into counseling, people that need services, get into services, because we identify their social needs. So I guess I'm grateful that I have that science background to say, okay, there are social economic needs that somebody may have, and I'm not going to judge them based upon my beliefs of who this person is. Because like you said, the person at the bus stop still needs help, regardless of whatever the billionaire is doing, amassing so much wealth. So I'm grateful that I can help these people. And I, and I feel like I'm less judgmental. I'm more compassionate because of my belief system. And yes, we're all on the same playing field. I'm not going to throw stones at glass houses. I'm not going to judge people. I'm going to help people. And we've had some very, very interesting cases that have come into the office that when you sit back, you're like, I was able to help them. I was able to help them. And that's my belief. And like you just said, with your, you know, your one client, you just tremendously helped that, you know, you don't know what that ripple effect is going to happen. Once that energy gets started, it's just, it's going to spread out to all of us. Science or not, like when you help one person, that's going to help millions of people. And I think that goes down to our beliefs and how we're connected to divine. You know, you're a channel, I'm a channel. If I'm giving a reading to someone or an energy healing, that's my beliefs. That's, you know, I'm connected to divine. But when I'm in my office, I'm still utilizing my beliefs. I'm still connected, but I'm backing it up with science. You know what I mean? So I guess I'm two different people. I'm like, I'm here, I'm, here, I'm there. <laughs> Well, and so in, I love it. <laughs> in the client that I'm talking about, who like, honest to goodness, I'm not revealing any personal details, no, no, no. Of this yeah. person or de de betraying any confidences. Yeah, it gave me like almost uh, like proof of the exact concept that we're talking about here, because everything that he was guided towards in those readings had a basis in the understanding of what toxic stress and uh, the complex mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress disorder could do to emotional regulation issues and the coping yeah. mechanisms that we develop around them. So those were all available within tarot readings that I do on, on YouTube. So yeah. all of this help was like mostly free. He's only ever had two readings. Um, and that's all very interesting. Like, it's like, well, you read a lot, you study a lot. Like, isn't that just informing what you do on your YouTube channels? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm willing to see like, there's no woo woo connection here. How do you find me in the first place? Exactly. It's a giant world. This person is French Canadian. It's so true. How do people find us? That's how, how did that person us? find me? <laughs> And right. that's where it's like, can you make room for the idea that even if you don't know what label to put on it, 
that to me proves and like as somebody who's like really dedicated to no that's just a coincidence you know that mathematically that someday if you open up your dryer you're going to see every item folded because mathematically that is possible yes but it's not probable please do that it's not please probable that. right exactly so like when does that get please to happen do that. <laughs> um it, people win the lottery which is also that same like you know the odds are giantly against it but it's not magic yeah it's <laughs> Here's the thing. The odds are giantly against it. And this person was looking for their answers. And I had ones that had scientific and emotional regulation validity available in the area that he went towards. And if you really want to explain that away as being like, that could just be coincidence. It really could. Yeah, that person is not the cheese. They do not stand alone. There's a lot of people who can say that. And in a big and diverse world, there have been people across the globe who have found Rachel, who have found me for yeah. answers. And what explains that if it is not being drawn to an energy that is trying to benefit you, which is mm -hmm. what the core issue around the idea of belief is, that mm -hmm. there is energy that will guide you towards what is best for you. And I'm always telling people the whole litmus test around your anxiety. Your anxiety never ends in a question mark. If it ends in a question, I'm sorry, your intuition never ends in a question mark. That is your anxiety. If it is asking you, what if this, what if that, if you are creating mm. something in your head and wondering what you will do, that is your anxiety. It is never your intuition. Mm -hmm. Your intuition gives you information. But there is one thing that I have not been adding up until this point, which is that your intuition will give you information about how to make a situation better. No matter if it's a difficult situation, like you need Absolutely. to leave that relationship or you need to quit that job. It will give you the information about what you need to do. It is action yes. oriented around yes. that. It is your guidance. It is your guidance. Your intuition is your guidance. And again, people who can't believe in anything immaterial, I understand that. I do. Because it's easier to invest in. Can I touch it? Can I see it? Can I prove it with math? But that's where we start going into science is so much of what we believe about reality is theoretical. Meaning right. we have no real proof of it, but we accept it as fact because, fact because the math adds up. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I got to above 500 people who I was helping and were able to find me on that big and diverse globe, I was like, that's enough math for me. Okay, I don't know what's going on here. I cannot, it doesn't come from a book. It doesn't come from a lesson plan, but it is clearly and obviously happening. And it could still have a completely scientific explanation where we're all made from the same stardust. So we're drawn back together. I do not know. I don't know that part, but it started to amass enough proof in my own eyes that it gave me a firmer belief in what I was connected to. Even mm. if there is in my little scientific heart who always loved Jonas Salk and still thinks he's one of the best men who ever lived. Honest to goodness, he was one of, he was my first hero. I and love that. I was, I was like a little kid. I was a little kid when I read a biography. And Harriet Tubman was my other one because I just thought she was the bravest person who had ever lived. Because she kept going back as a former slave to help free other people. And those were the people I admired. Jonas Salk mm. did not patent his vaccine. He wanted it to be available to or everyone. Or the people. Exactly. Yeah. It's It really is. We do ourselves a disservice when we only allow science and exploration and research and new findings to have absolutely no room for belief that you are being guided towards the answers that will help you the most. Because we have been. I mean, if you want to look at outside of science, somebody like Beethoven, the man could not hear. How did he write no. music? <laughs> <laughs> that that it's like that's that seems like it, and he was not a great guy in terms of like his interpersonal skills, but he created enduring beauty that does not make sense from the very 3D practical world. You want to yeah. talk about, oh, he put his ear against the um, piano and felt the vibrations. Felt the vibrations, yeah. That does not explain how he understood what a flute would sound like within a musical composition. No. It doesn't so explain true. it entirely. It is only the thing that we are reaching for when it's like, I can't accept anything unless it has valid proof behind it. And I have respect for that. We accept too much without enough proof. And in fact, we mm. have lost the idea that something can be proven or disproven through a set of facts. It's called True. the narrative collapse. 
There is a narrative around logic that has started to collapse because we have so little faith in our governing bodies for good reason. But that doesn't mean that we should abandon the idea that something should be proven or disproven. And that if somebody gives you a fact that is uh, it completely contradicts what you believe, don't reject it out of a feeling of being on fragile ground. Examine it and see if it does make you change your course, because we're always at crossroads throughout the course of our lives. We're not meant to stay yeah. the same people. We're meant to be evolving throughout the course of our life. Now, Rachel, I'm pretty sure you actually attend a church. Is that correct? That is true. <laughs> okay. So like, can you talk to me a little bit about, because you believe in a lot of the same ways that I yes. do. What does that help you with? Uh, it helps me with community and it helps me with feeling connected. And I, the, the pastor, his name is Pastor Buddy, and I love the way that he speaks and I love the way that he puts things into real life examples and he channels the Holy Spirit. So, and I channel angels. So I'm like, Hey, we're on the same lane. Other people might think that's, that's not the case, but I'm like, I'm Holy Spirit activated also. So, and I, I just, I love his message about having strength of character, having, not being apathetic, not, and he'll be like, He'll say you're your flesh sack. So to me, I we're a soul having a human experience. And you know, I may kind of put it off in more divine terminology that he's putting it in, but I can relate to everything that he's saying. And I love that he brings together community. And it also has helped my family. Like, you know, I have very religious family members who may feel that what I do is not whatever. And that's fine. But we can still come together at church and still be in community and still love one another. I'm going to love you no matter, you know, you're my family member and I'm not going to judge you. And, you know, maybe their beliefs will shift and that's okay. But that's why I like church because it, it's brought my son who is 15 years old, who used to think, you know, he used to think that he was an atheist. And then he's like, well, you know what, mom, I really want, I'm down with Jesus. So that's what he told me. We went for a walk. He's like, I'm now down with Jesus. And I want to start going to church and I want to talk to grandma. My, um, his grandmother has stage four cancer. Um, she now has no evidence of active disease, which is a miracle to me. That's angels, God, universe healing her. And she started going back to church. And he's like, I want to talk to grandma because it's her belief system that healed her, you know, and so I'm like, okay, let's go. So we went to talk to, you know, his grandma and now like we all go to church together and it's a beautiful family event. You know, if we don't do anything else together, except for go to church and have that beautiful moment of, you know, raising the hands. And I love the energy of the songs and, you know, and you know, sometimes I'm like, this is so corny. I'm not going to lie. You know, sometimes I'm like, oh God. But <laughs> I, I, I sang in the Episcopal choir. Like it's uh, you know? honest to goodness. So it's like you you were a choir girl. Yes, I was a choir. Yeah. Girl. I'm it. sure that I any existing exactly. members from that are slightly horrified because it's like, aren't you a big old witch now? It's like, well, yeah, but I'm a high priestess in celestial and angelic magic. And there you go. There you go. Um, and that's why I love going to church. It, it helps me to be. I feel like it's it's helping me to kind of really shift some of my beliefs. It's helping me really to shift some of how I want to practice as a spiritual practitioner and helping people clear the cl clutter. That's one thing he talks about, clear the clutter. Well, I can do that energetically. I can do that spiritually. Like, but how do you do that? Having strength and character. Maybe I need to lean on my Christianity beliefs. I'm not sure. We'll see how it develops. Every now and then it helps to touch base with the idea of a uh, collective uh, yeah, absolutely. energy. When I talked about unifying experience, yeah. like here's the easiest way to relate to that. Um, Princess Diana's death where people across the globe were really, really de deeply, deeply upset by the death of this, you know, very glamorous. And, you know, she was pretty young when she died. I think she was 36. Yeah, I'm not positive. Young. Um, she was young and uh, people across the world were mourning and it was yeah. because it helped us unite. Harry Potter, the Harry Potter fiction, um, people used to go to midnight launches across the globe on the days those biz those books were released. And J.K. Rowling is not somebody I admire as a human being these days, but I do love that she created something that made a child in Indonesia have something uh, completely in common with a kid in Washington State where they were doing the same thing on the same day, diving into a book. 
book. That is a Absolutely. beautiful, beautiful thought. And that's what community, even up into including going to religious services, does. It gives you the feeling of being in a massive energy that is trying to do the same thing. So it's almost yeah. like getting your battery recharged. For me, yeah. it's always going to be going out into the woods because of that Quaker farm camp where we would go and you know sit in the woods because they have meetings, nobody talks. I loved it. Um, and that's where I really developed an ability to be able to feel like I am connected to something. Mm -hmm. but that is the worth of being part of something, of a group. Absolutely. Now, unfortunately, what we've talked about is the distancing groups that we have, the divisive groups, where it can be a very negative thing. And we've seen that with, you know, the crowd chaos that can, uh, like crowd mentality that can sweep over people and like perfectly normal people are suddenly like flipping over police cars because they get caught up in that energy. Remember, that can work for the good as well. And so Absolutely. it is important to try and seek out a group, a collective that can help you feel as if you have that intensified energy, that battery charger to try yeah. and put you back in touch. But the problem becomes is please don't be exclusive, exclusive to people who are not part of that. They're all part of this world. Everybody is struggling and looking for their answers. And one of the things that we see over and over in the work that we do is how much suffering people are not showing to other people as they try yeah. and resolve their pain within. That when you walk out into this world, when you see somebody, understand they are in some, they have experienced a form of pain that they have never shown to another person. You have far more in common with them than you might believe, no matter what group they say they belong to, no matter what bumper stickers they have. Um, one of the strangest things about where I live now is before I moved here, I was like, if I could have whatever I wanted, I would move to the middle of the woods. And people who've been here, every window that you look out, all you see are trees. It looks like oh, a woods from where I am, but there's a lot more to it than that. I live in uh, like a conjunction of faith houses that is bizarre. Literally right next door is a mosque. Right next door to that is a Catholic church. On the other side of the mosque is a Hindu temple. I'm absolutely positive there has to be like a Buddhist temple and a yeah. temple that I simply don't know about because I'm in the middle of these faith structures. And it feels, uh, it is so safe and kind of protected here. And then I was out in the Botanic Gardens one day and I was trying to, and this was like over a year ago, and I was walking along a trail and thinking to myself, if I could have anything, I would have the type of place where I could get up in the morning and I could go walk around in nature. And it's only like, it's like I'm opening up my front door, I'm there and I just turn around and I come home easily because I'm a tourist. So I like to be at home a lot. Um and uh, sure enough, uh, within the year, I started noticing trailheads all over the neighborhood that I live in. And I am actually five minutes from three different national parks. And it does Amazing. mean I can walk out my front door and within five minutes be at a waterfall, be in the mountains. And they're well-traversed uh, hiking trails, so I do not feel unsafe, even though I go yeah. out there. Um, I encounter people. It's always very, very delightful. Bony Mountain, which has, and, and I kind of identifying where I am. Guys, you can find me if you really freaking try, but why would you bother? Like, you know, <laughs> if like you can book an appointment with me, it's really, really, really easy to find me. Um, I'm not concerned about the idea that, because I'm not a particular controversial person i'm telling yeah. people to please heal your stuff and accept others yeah. try and solve the problems of this world and if you find that controversial then like you got something to heal because that is simply a solution that is being offered without judgment or the idea that we are excluding others from those solutions but what i yeah. can't say is looking at this world is that a lot's broken and we're not doing enough to fix it and if that is not to guilt nor shame anybody, but what it is saying is start by healing yourself. Figure out why you're sad or angry or the things that you fear. Start figuring mm -hmm. that stuff out and resolving it. And however you find that resolution, whether it's like Rachel and I through a, a bit greater connection to a spiritual presence or simply a greater understanding of yourself that is based in the scientific study of behavioral sciences that tell you about your emotional development and why you are who you are. Whether, yeah. no matter what it is, greater clarity into who you are 
gives you more power within your world because you're no longer tripping over your own stumbling blocks. And that can come to you through a scientific setting or that can come to you through a spiritual setting. Now, I have yeah. a, an esoteric podcast. You run the Spiritual Spotlight, which yeah. is your podcast. So most of the people who come towards us are going to be comfortable with spirituality. Absolutely. But as proven from my client roster, it's not always true. I have had people who were, had somebody give them an appointment or booked with me after listening to me, and they didn't believe beforehand. And afterwards, even if they didn't have wholehearted belief, they're like, there's something. I don't know I what that is, but there's something. And it's just that leaving room for there to be something beyond your understanding that is also one of the key elements of belief. And it is also one of the key principles of scientific discovery is accepting that there is more to be discovered. So science and belief are actually, they make good roommates if you allow them to. Yeah. Closing thoughts, Rachel? No, I just, I love how you just put all that together. So I always love speaking with you. You have amazing, amazing ideas. And I love how you put it together. I, I'm, I'm semi-convinced we had to have been from the same family at some point during like, you know, uh, some form of reincarnation <laughs> event. Because from the very first time I ever saw Rachel, like, she booked me for her podcast uh, first. And yeah. the very first time I saw her, I was like, wait, I know you. <laughs> like, um, I don't know. I'm like, sure you, you know. I know you. <laughs> like, and it has always been that way. I'm so grateful yeah. to you for making time. Rachel yeah. has a full-time job. She does this on the side as well. She's yeah. a very, very busy lady. And I'm so grateful to you for making the time to have these type of discussions. Because even though we might be preaching to the choir, as the saying goes, it may contain something that allows someone to have greater comfort with the idea of scientific fact yeah. and spiritual belief do not need to exist in a yin yang. One is black, one is white area is that they really can co-mingle and one, the ability to believe can actually fuel the other's ability to Absolutely. discover when we are not excluding something because we don't have proof of it yet. We don't Absolutely. get it yet. And uh, it just in closing on this one, Stephen Hawking was a tremendous gift to this world, but I do vehemently and obviously, and I believe with a fair amount of personal evidence, and that's what you need for your own belief, refute the idea that there is no purpose for a divine presence in your life. The purpose of the divine in your life is to help you find how to be your best ally, your best friend, and to live your most purposeful life. It is not to judge others. It is to understand and embrace you and to feel the love and the guidance of something that means you very well indeed, and it means everyone very well indeed. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been Logical Magic Examining Esoterica. Rachel, where can people find you? AkashicAngels.com, or you can find me at Rachel C. Garrett on YouTube or Spiritual Spotlight Series on all podcast channels, which Elaine was a beautiful guest on, so please check it out. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed doing that. You thank you. Here, logical Magic Examining Esoterica at TheRisingMoon.com. Chromecast at The Rising Moon is my YouTube channel. And then once again, I have a Patreon where I'm doing things like teaching and giving weekly readings and eventually we'll be going to monthly readings as well. And I had to do that because the ad revenue on YouTube drops so very, very, very substantially that it's like the only way that I could keep doing the work that I was doing was to figure out a way to monetize some of it. And so it's a very low cost. It's $5 a month and I don't have any big plans of creating anything more costly. But if I ever do, I would give you plenty of advance warning. And you can find me there as well. Everything is linked in the episode notes or in the description box down below. Make room for a connection to something yes. that wants to guide you and it will find the way to reach you. Take care. Absolutely. Live magically.